Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? You all are a quiet bunch today, so hopefully uh, this will be a robust conversation. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, I want to make sure that this room is a psychologically safe room, the meaning that people have the freedom to share their personal opinions with you all about this topic, but also uh, that the opinions and views that are shared during this presentation are actually personal views of the individuals here. They don't represent any organization, any company, et cetera, and they're not speaking uh, officially on behalf of anything. Secondly, I'd like to uh, just uh, make it a safe space for everyone to share their thoughts and their opinions at the audience. We're gonna ask questions uh, to you all, and uh, we want no fear of judgment uh, or retaliation or any retribution for sharing your thoughts and opinions here. So this is a free and safe space. Just wanted to make that disclaimer up front. My name is Kevin Nichols. I, uh, I started my career at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory as a mechanical engineering intern. Since then, I started, uh, thought I wanted to be a lawyer and worked in big law firms for a long time, starting diversity programs. Ended up doing some consulting uh, with uh, companies like Fitbit, uh, Stanford, and actually Berkeley Lab. I ended up coming here in 2017, starting the diversity program here with uh, um, a team. And now I am the senior uh, idea integration partner, meaning uh, idea stands for inclusion, diversity, equity, and accountability. So I've been asked to moderate this panel and I'm gonna ask my panelists to introduce themselves and talk about uh, their career tra trajectory, how they got here and um, why they're on this panel. So let's start from the left with Soledad. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Soledad Toledano, and uh, I work in uh, cybersecurity at Google. Now, I'm also the founder of Girls Can Hack, which is a nonprofit um, that um, aims to close the gender gap. We started here in California, and now we have opened a new chapter in Spain also, so we are expanding to Europe. And I used to work here. I worked here for 10 years uh, doing cybersecurity, and I'm very happy to be back for this. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Jim Marsteller, and for those of you that have attended the summit before, you might know me. I've been associated with the summit for about 20 years now, it's been a long time. Um, I was the Chief Information Security Officer at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Uh, and currently I'm a member of Trusted CI, I have been for quite a while, um, on the program chair for the, the uh, committee as well. Um, trying to think of what else is relevant or important. That's probably good enough, I think. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm Damien Roussan, and I'm the group lead for the Computer Languages and Systems Software Group here at Berkeley Lab. And I'm new to this community. Uh, Sean Peichert invited me to join Trusted CI uh, initially to focus on DEI issues, but also thinking about expanding into software assurance, uh, possibly. And uh, I have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in, in mechanical engineering, sort of wandered into computer science. I sampled just about every career path along the way, so I won't take you through that story. Um, when I moved into computer science, focused mostly on software engineering for science and then high-performance computing, and more recently, AI for high-performance computing, HPC. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Cheryl Washington. Uh, currently, I'm the CISO for the University of California at Davis. My journey is pretty long, so I won't bore you with the details, but suffice to say that I, too, am new to this community and I actually started my career at UC Berkeley many, many moons ago. Um, before becoming a, a CISO, I spent a lot of my time in the technology arena, particularly technology management. In addition to my duties as a CISO for UC Davis, I also serve as the first CISO appointed to the EDUCAUSE board. Applause to them for actually recognizing the role of the security officer. Um, I have a number of other appointments, including, interesting enough, there's an organization that's been looking at the you know, perfect marriage, so to speak, between agriculture and cybersecurity. And they reached out to me and asked me if I'd be willing to join that conversation. And I said, sure, agriculture and cybersecurity. Who would have thought of that, right? <laughs> but in any event, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. All right, and let's dig in. 
So before I ask our panelists questions, I wanted to poll the audience. Uh, in light of the recent Supreme Court decision regarding affirmative action, how many people feel that diversity, equity, and inclusion programs are still necessary? By show of hands. Oh, interesting. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's go ahead and get started, panelists. Uh, number one, the word trusted is used repeatedly throughout the marketing materials for this conference. How do you build trust with individuals from different backgrounds and experiences? And whoever wants to join and answer first may do so. <clears throat> um, well, so as uh, a member of the organization with trust in its name, uh, that's something, and to me personally, that's really, really important. I think one of the goals of Trusted CI or this, the people here in this room is to build relationships, to be able to share experiences that we can all learn from each other. And that's really, really difficult. Uh, in our professional field, trust is someone that, that you are, um, that you know is going to respect your confidentiality uh, with the information that you share with them. You know that they're safe. That's another uh, adjective I think that um, goes hand, hand in hand with that. And um, it's something, and John just mentioned in this slide, it's something that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy for you to build that up with someone. And it's something you really need to cherish because it can, um, it, it's hard to come by and can be uh, you know, shattered as well. Um, uh, personally, um, uh, you know, I'm uh, on this panel here, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community. And for someone in, you know, trust is, has a different meaning where you want to feel safe with someone. You want to be genuine. You want to be able to share who you are. And that takes a lot to, to really, you know, open up to someone. And uh, um, with this community here, it's been like a family. So uh, I'm really happy to feel like uh, I belong here. And it's a, a really great group of people to work with. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I'll pick up on that theme as well. Um, in my world, in my field, very few problems can be solved by one person and one person alone. In most cases, we actually have to operate as a team. And team members are going to have to trust each other, trust their judgment, trust their frailties. Um, we're human. And what I've seen is, is that um, when my staff members open themselves up to being um, honest with themselves and certainly honest with me and honest with the other members of the team, we actually can solve problems. And, and they know that we have no choice but to solve problems. So in many, many ways, trust sort of, it, it sort of manifests itself by building, as, as you pointed out, Jim, the relationships that we absolutely need in order to do the job that we've been hired to do, appointed to do, desire to do. Um, the other, I think, element is when I'm looking for staff members, or even when I'm mentoring people, I, I forgot to mention, I spend an awful lot of my time mentoring individuals who want to enter either the cyber field or grow into a leadership position. We talk a lot about the human element. We talk a lot about relationship building. We spend a lot of time talking about trust. It's an element of our success and failure to aspire to achieve trust and build those strong relationships means in many ways, we're not gonna succeed at doing the hard work that we, we are tasked to do. So this is an interesting question for me because I, I think as a personal philosophy, I try to start with trust as a default position. Um, but the question is making me reflect and realize that no matter what's going on inside of me, even if I think I'm trusting and being trustworthy, there are two or more people in every interaction. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the other person perceives me that way or the other person feels comfortable being who they are. And so I think a, a big part of it uh, is embracing difference, making sure that everyone gets to show up as their whole selves, basically, right? Um, and uh, I guess being intentional and, and communicating intentionality uh, around that. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Excellent. Adding just a little thing. I agree with all of you. Um, I think uh, also it's important to note um, that um, not on, it's not only important to build trust, but also uh, you need to support 
all of these diverse people in building their trust, right? Because this is a profession that is really based on that. And sometimes when you have uh, people from diverse backgrounds, it's difficult for them to build that trust and they can lose it very easily. So uh, to have, it, have that in mind in terms of uh, building teams, I think is very important. Excellent. And you touched upon a, a point at the end of that where you said, you know, people from different backgrounds, et cetera, having to, um, you know, sometimes maybe have to work harder at getting tr people to trust them because they look different or they come from different backgrounds or have a different dialect that they speak. Uh, transitioning to uh, my next question, which talks about um, National Science Foundation's um, website. And on the website, they talk about diversity initiatives. And the mission that they state on their diversity initiatives is to recruit, retain, and develop a diverse, high-performing workplace that draws from all segments of society and values fairness, diversity, and inclusion to promote the, the progress of science. Why do you think that, it is, that this is important, number one? And number two, how challenging is it to establish this mission? Who would like to? So, oh, did you say something? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Playing a little hot potato around. Here. Okay. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? The, re the I question. Need more coffee too. Okay. <laughs> just, just basically, the, the website says that its its mission is to recruit and retain diverse talent. Why do you think that this is important, and how challenging is it to accomplish this mission? So it's, I think it's very challenging in a way and not that challenging in some others. So uh, I think uh, there's a lot of like uh, prior, you know, like thinking that it's very difficult to attract diversity. Um, and uh, for example, you know, you, you will go to a cybersecurity conference where there's only men, right? Uh, uh, in panels and stuff. And when you uh, um, speak with the, people that is organizing those uh, um, uh, conferences and stuff, uh, they they think it's very difficult to attract other types, right? But it's, I mean, they we are out there. Mm -hmm. um, so um, sometimes it's just uh, uh, maybe um, in my experience, sometimes it's just like uh, when people feel that they are going to be treated with respect and they are welcome, um, it's uh, probably 75% of the job done in, in terms of attracting diversity. So I think that's uh, very important. So if you think that people felt that they would be more, they'd feel included attending or participating, that they would uh, apply and or um, register and come to a conference. Yeah, so um, in my experience, when I had, had to build teams, uh, and hire people, um, it was not that difficult for me to find diversity. They, it, it will come to me, right? So that gives me the measure of, um, sometimes the complexity depends on the environment. The, the uh, comment regarding conferences really resonates with me because I see it all of the time. You can imagine as a African-American female attending um, many of these cyber conferences, I'm usually the only one in the room. So I, I definitely understand that point. Uh, with respect to the importance, let me just be practical. There are not enough of us to go around. I mean, that's the reality. Um, there was a time in my space where I was losing a staff member a month. And you know the work was not diminishing by any stretch of the imagination. So imagine those of us who were left, we were doubling up on our efforts to try to keep up with uh, the cyber challenges that faced our institution. Um, the reality is that, again, there aren't enough of us to go around and we're gonna have to broaden the pool. Um, and I think that it's the right thing to do for many, many different reasons. Cyber is a different, more complicated space. You need diversity of thought. If there was a canned solution to every problem we ever had, I probably wouldn't have a job. You have to think creatively and think differently and bringing people who have diverse backgrounds actually adds to your, your roster, to your ability to, again, think outside the box. The challenges have often been along the lines of sort of our past. 
catching up with us. If you ever read a job description for a cybersecurity professional, um, it's a little unique, uh, almost too well refined to talk about what you once hired as opposed to what you need to hire in the near future. And so one of the ways that we've sort of combat the challenge of getting more people into our pipeline is to recast what we were looking for in terms of an individual. Um, I'm less inclined to think about the technology that they've been exposed to, but more importantly, thinking about the character they bring to the team. It goes back to our first question about relationships and being able to work with a very diverse community, which we represent. Uh, so I think I've sort of tackled this question in two veins. One, we need more people, simply put. And two, we need to think more creatively about how we bring people into our pipeline. So I'll add, uh, partly following up on that same theme, I think it's an economic imperative. Um, I also think it's a quality imperative. So on the economic piece, it's a lot of what you know Cheryl was just saying. We really have to be sampling the entire population, especially as the population demographics changes. You can see that most clearly in California. As of around 2001, um, no group, no racial or ethnic group in California is in the majority. Every racial and ethnic group in California is a minority. As of around 2015, white Californians are no longer the largest minority. The largest minority is Hispanics. So now this room is sampling the nation, but go to a restaurant here, go to a grocery store here. Any room you walk into, if there is any racial or ethnic group that's in the majority, that room is skewed relative to the population of this state. You know, so I think sometimes if you look at things like that and you think about it and realize what are the forces it took to determine this outcome in this setting, and you realize that it can't really, it can't happen by chance, it means that we're going to have to do something to change it if we want to be sampling the entire population. I say it's a quality imperative also uh, because uh, there are a lot of studies that have showed that more diverse groups produce better outcomes. Um, a friend sent me a great paper uh, last year the, the title of it was The Diversity Innovation Paradox. And this was published by a, an education professor working with computer scientists where they looked at a very nearly comprehensive uh, collection of every PhD dissertation that was published in the US from about 1977 to 2015. And they were looking for innovation. And one way they measured the innovation was two disparate ideas from very different fields being brought into contact you know, in this dissertation. And they found that the smaller someone's demographic grouping is in the population at a given institution. Let's say if you're a woman, the smaller the percentage of women, the more likely you'd see innovative work. Um, unfortunately, they also found that the smaller your percentage is in the population, the less likely that work would be cited by others, would be taken up by others at the same institution. So, you know, there's a lot that shows that we, we benefit from this. We will get better outcomes very much along the lines of what Cheryl was saying as well. So it's, quality imperative too. Would you like to add? <clears throat> I would just say that, um, can anyone hear, hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I would just say that I've always really appreciated working with people that challenge my, my own beliefs, you know, and to look at things a different way. Uh, it gives you that ability to, to grow and kind of try to understand things from a different perspective. And I think that's really important for security. You want someone that can take a look at something and view it from many different angles. And if you're with a group of people that, you know, were raised similarly or had the same similar education or background, you tend to have the group think that we see in social media where people form these little circles that people that think very similarly to them and don't ever really challenge some of the, your core beliefs. And I think that's really important for people, for us to understand and to grow um, emotionally and developmentally. Um, it, but it's also extreme. I was really happy yesterday that we had Anshul uh, Rege, who was our keynote speaker, talking about human factors and social engineering. Um, the human aspect of what we do is so important. You know, it's it's very easy for us to set up a scanner and you know scan systems to find out what operating system, what vulnerabilities they have. People are much different, and we are a huge part of this system. And uh, I really welcome seeing people. Uh, enter this space that are not, you know, hardcore coders or technical people, but people that stu studied sociolo sociology or, you know, other uh, human aspects. That's an area that I think um, 
we really overlook in our field and it plays such a key part. And as far as uh, hiring, it's, I think everyone in this room knows, it's extremely difficult to fill positions. We have such uh, um, a lack of qualified candidates or people that are in this field to even fill positions, which makes uh, you know trying to find really diverse candidates even more difficult. So very much interested in seeing what we can do to try to uh, solve that problem in the future. Because it's something that this nation needs to be, uh, it needs to attain for us to be competitive. You know, we ha- we've got lots of emerging nations that are um, uh, in the field of AI, cybersecurity. We saw a talk yesterday about the big business of uh, ransomware and the money that can be made. And uh, just for our nation, I think we need to be more innovative, be more inclusive, and, and build that workforce for the future. Sure. Go ahead. I'm so glad you you talked about the human element. I I am absolutely convinced that the growth of our program at Davis is really going to have to extend itself to spending a lot more time and attention talking about that human element in every single dimension from ICS security, research security, IoT security, you name it. If we continue along the same path, I'm not so sure that any of our programs, and I'm not speaking exclusively about UC Davis, but any of our programs are really gonna be as successful as we would like. There's a a relatively, I'd call it new to me, branch of cybersecurity that is growing called cyber psychology. And it's really speaking to the human element of cybersecurity and what that all means. I was really intrigued by the um, earlier presentations yesterday. A lot of them did speak to that same theme. And I I think it would be remiss on our part if we overlook the necessity of bringing more of that human element into our conversation across multiple dimensions. So I really appreciate your comment. Um, Also, I think that I would like to to add to the discussion in the sense of also looking at uh, the way that we look at recruitment and retention of people in this industry. Oftentimes you have, uh, when you're looking for a job, you'll go to your alumni association, you'll go to friends and colleagues and ask for referrals, uh, et cetera. So it's very difficult or challenging to get representation outside of that if these are the trusted sources that you go to to find new talent. Uh, also, you, you look at a certain pedigree of schools or where people come from. So if you're looking for people, there might be people at San Jose State, for example, or Sacramento State that are in cyber, that are trying to get in this field, but you're not looking for them there. Or if they go, attend a historically black college or university or a minority serving institution, you're not looking for them there. So you don't know uh, that they're there. So thinking outside the box of how we look at bringing talent in, I think can also address some of the challenges that are are here. Let me um, transition with this to a next question, which uh, one of- in, oh, Can I say one more thing before you move on? Um, just related to that same topic. Mm-hmm. Um, I oftentimes say, if you're looking for people from underrepresented groups, go where those groups are overrepresented which is exactly what you're talking about in terms of engaging with HBCUs. When we think about diversity and we think about things like recruiting, like recruiting, we're bringing people to us, right? So we're trying to, if there's a gender imbalance in this room, we're maybe going out and trying to find, you know, more, more women, more, more non-binary people to, you know, come into this setting. There is a way in which I think that that is actually kind of problematic. I think it's something that we do need to do but it always means that the person who's in the minority is coming into a setting where they're going to once again be in the minority. Mm-hmm. But when we think about, so last year I participated in a series of conferences uh, where the DOE National Lab community, they had these workshops uh, thinking about what AI can do for science and then generating a report that goes to Congress. Hopefully Congress will create some billion, billion dollar program and we can all apply for research grants you know, from this program, right? It's a, it's a kind of a standard routine that the DOE National Lab community does. And they did, the people leading this, uh, these workshops, Rick Stevens at Argonne National Lab is the one who led the whole series of workshops, um, decided that each workshop was going to be held at a minority serving institution. Okay, the first one was UC Davis, uh, which is now considered a Hispanic serving institution. They also had one at uh, Bowie State uh, in Maryland, which is a historically black college. 
And not only that, the, the, the first one I think didn't necessarily go all that great from the standpoint of engaging the campus, but, but you know, you learn as you go. By the time they got to the third one of these, which was the one at Bowie State that I attended, they were tracking data and they were able to say 13% of the people in, at this workshop are, are from the campus, you know. Um, so as we're thinking about bringing people into these settings where, you know, once again, they're going to be in the minority, which isn't always the best experience. I can tell you because I integrated schools as a child. I've integrated workplaces as an adult. Let's also think about what can we do to move into these spaces, you know, having a conference at a women's college, for example, you know, um, things like that. That's awesome. It's a great segue into the next question. Uh, NSF strategic goal number two on its website um, under the uh, subheading of under workplace uh, inclusion, it says it seeks to cultivate a culture that encourages collaboration, flexibility, and fairness to enable individuals to contribute to their full potential and further retention. How can NSF create a culture like this? And what are some of the barriers that it needs to overcome in order to do so? I'm not very familiar with the, the institution, uh, so I can speak generally. I think uh, everything that we have said till now applies, especially thinking uh, outside the box and um, especially in the field of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, I will say like having patience is key to attract attract diverse workforce because uh, we um, there's an imbalance in general in um, the cybersecurity workforce uh, in uh, government and industry. So it's true that uh, we need always more people. But for example, industries I feel in the pipelines right now just injecting people, not, no matter what the backgrounds, right? right? So we have, for example, people doing incident response and the, their backgrounds are in law for example. So you build char the character of these people, the mindset, the, I mean, um, the, you know, you, you're not going to have, you know, very, a lot of expertise because really there's a shortage, but you need to build that up. So having that in mind and having patience with uh, people that is coming in new, especially people with different backgrounds, I think is key. And it's, it's the thing that is already happening because we have been debating this forever and uh, we, I don't think we have come to any solutions. So uh, this is something that is happening now. And and I think it's kind of working at least better, better than before. So. Um, those are fantastic you know, starting points and I would, also offer the word be intentional. I, I too am not terribly familiar with the ecosystem, NSF's ecosystem, but I would suggest that as we said before, you know, I don't know if we have much of a choice. We're gonna have to, have to embark on this objective and you know, appreciate the um, full breadth of the goal itself. I would add in terms of being patient, also be intentional, you know, as, as, as Damien pointed out, there are areas, places, people we can go to and engage, um, partner, collaborate, and move you know, individuals forward into their, these spaces. Um, the reality is, at least in my shop, and one of my staff members is in the audience, so he knows this for a fact, that our, our more, most recent hires were not cybersecurity experts. They had the right attitude. They were highly motivated, fantastic dispositions, and with some training and patience, they're growing into the types of, of staff members that we need as part of our team. And the word team is still operative here. They have to also be part of that relationship that we're building out as part of our program. So I, I certainly appreciate uh, the patience piece of the element. And again, I'd add to that, be intentional. I'd say the biggest barrier we face is the past. It's everything that has brought us to this point. You know, how did we get to a point where we have norms and practices and policies in place that led to the outcomes we currently have in terms of you know, lacking uh, diversity and inclusivity and equity in certain regards. And so a lot of it is you know, battling that built up you know, history and how do, we, how do we change things? 
um, when you were talking about someone uh, coming into your organization with a very different background, not necessarily a security background, um, you know, I think in a way that's an example. Uh, Sean and I have been having a lot of these conversations, so I apologize that you're going to hear this for the 10th time, <laughs> but I haven't met most of you. Hmm. Um, I often say that a lot of times organizations, I think, have a naive notion that they can diversify and not really change. Basically, we're going to have a lot more people from underrepresented, underrepresented groups here, but we'll be doing the same thing that we've always been doing. And, you know, I frequently say that I don't think that's the case. For example, it sounds like maybe your recruiting is changing and that's part of what's in enabling you to bring in a more diverse population, right? And so the, the, the backgrounds of the people you're hiring is different, which probably also means that some of the activities they might engage in once they are there is different. So the organizations will change, not just in composition, but in what they're doing actually. Um, I think we have to be, be ready for that. I think one point also that comes to mind is uh, I, I, I will, um, you know, embrace the notion of everybody chiming in because all, we are always the same people doing this, this type of work. And we, I mean, I have a job to do too, right? So I have my, we have our work, daily work and we are doing this type of like engagement and um, uh inclusion and belonging work on the side, basically. So at, at, at some point that um, um, you have to pay a toll for that because it's too much for a little, uh, a, a very a small group of people. So uh, to, I think to, in order to be a, a good, cult, good cult culture, everybody needs to chime in at some point. <clears throat> I'll just say, I, was anyone here for the 2013 summit? It was in um, DC. Okay, a few people here. So um, a good colleague of mine, Ardeth Hassler, it was the last day, and we'll be doing this tomorrow. At the end of the summit, we ask for observations and things that people have noted uh, throughout the summit. And uh, she got up and, uh, to the microphone, and she just said, um, just like everyone to stop and take a look around the room. And she said, I'm the only woman here. And it just was like, wow, a sobering moment for me. I didn't realize it. And just sitting here today, looking at the makeup of the, the attendees here, I think we've made some good progress. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, uh, this can continue. And you know, the, we've tried to do as much as we can as well, uh, but there's only so much we can do. And that's really the purpose of my role here is to learn from experts here and uh, to make it uh, a more um, uh, welcoming community for everyone. So I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm glad everyone's here, and I hope that you are, are participate in this discussion um, and hope to see you in following summits as well. Thank you, Jim. That's a great segue because you'd mentioned that, you know, people are experts. So we're actually going to turn the tables right now and hear from some of the experts in the audience. Um, when I asked the beginning of this, I asked you, uh, in light of the recent Supreme Court decision regarding affirmative action, how many people feel that diversity, equity, inclusion programs are still necessary? The majority of the room raised their hands. So now we would like to hear uh, what you are doing um, at your respective places of work that are furthering um, that that notion that you raised your hand and said that it's important. Well, if it's important, let us know and share with us what's going on in your laboratories or your place of work. Uh, and what you're at least, if you're not aware of or doing anything particularly regarding this, what ideas you might have as far as um, the challenges that you face in order to do that. So we'll have a, a microphone go around and uh, we have a hand up first and foremost. Thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so one of the things that I noticed at the University of Southern Maine when we hit COVID was that a lot of the remote uh, internships were going to white men and students of color, international students, which often are students of color and women were not getting internships at the same rates. 
And then I started doing more investigation and found that generally they were not getting internships at the same rates. And so we started um, the Cybersecurity Ambassador Program, and I'm going to do a birds of a feather presentation on that at the, the last track of the day. It's a shameless plug if you want to hear more about it. But we created an internship um, recruiting uh, women of color, uh, women, students of color, and creating a, a safe place. Because as you can imagine, in Maine, there's not a lot of diversity except in the Portland area and a lot with immigrant diaspora. And so we created a safe place and uh, started with a couple of students in doing internships. And we're now up to, um, we've had over 50 students go through it. They're now getting hired at, at higher rates. And, um, you know, we're continuing to expand that program. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And congratulations on that. Uh, I'd actually like to take a little poll of the room. Is anybody here besides me? Oh, sorry. you can't hear me? Okay, sorry. I can I can hear the speaker fine. <laughs> a little bit louder. Um, I'd like to poll the room. Is anybody uh, here besides me representing an HBCU or other minority serving university? I don't think so. Oh, one, two, two. Yeah. Okay. I think the big, so here's my real question is why aren't there more? That's the kind of problem I think we need to address. And, why do you think, let, let me give an add on that. So yeah, I, I represent uh, North Carolina ENT. and t okay. um, uh, Jose Sarvzetti has a center of excellence in cybersecurity. Um, I wonder if he was invited to this. For example, you know. So, what would be your takeaway from that? What would uh, what would you like the uh, the organizers of this conference to think about or consider going forward? Um, I guess I'm trying to think of how the phrase is. Um, it's a safe space. Is, is there is is there a well no no well, yeah no it's, it's not the safe space thing. I'm trying to I I'm trying to come up with a cogent way to say this. Um, was was there a failure that can be addressed? Right. Was was there outreach and nobody came? Fine, that's not a failure, right? Sure. Was there no outreach or what kind of outreach? That sort of thing. I think it's more general. I mean, maybe a more general. I I can't. I don't know if I can make this a question, but a, a comment, which is, I hear this a lot. But oh yeah, we need to increase diversity. We need to address it. It's a problem. It'd be good for us if we do. I hear less of actionable statements. What specific things can we do? What can people here actually take home and do that, that's clearly actionable more than just we should do something about it? Well, that's actually our final question for the panelists to answer, but um, <laughs> you jumped ahead of that. Nevertheless, though, I would like to hear others, but thank you for uh, sharing that. And that's not to put anyone on the spot, but that is something that I think um, definitely should be considered going forward. I hope you have your Fitbit on, Jeanette, and you're getting some stuff. You're getting <laughs> all these steps. Make sure you get your exercise today. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to follow up on uh, the conversation that Abe just started because he and I actually talked about this last night at the reception. Uh, we made the observation that it wasn't clear there were a lot of HBCU MI institutions represented. And one of our observations was maybe they don't have, uh, a lot of the folks who are here have large uh, scientific facilities and maybe the HBCU MIs not being top tier schools don't have such facilities. Uh, and hence aren't represented here. And then we sort of stepped back from that and asked ourselves, well, why don't they have large facilities or, mm -hmm. you know, facilities of any kind? And what could we, what could the community, what could NSF do uh, to try and, you know, foster and encourage the development of more cyber infrastructure facilities at uh, some of the lower tier uh, universities, which would then in turn give them greater representation uh, in venues like this. 
Um, and so I'm not familiar. NSF may, in fact, have, have such programs. They do a lot of work uh, in, in diversity and inclusion and you know, making sure underrepresented uh, groups are, are included. But uh, you know, one possibility would be to think more about how to encourage uh, cyber infrastructure uh, for, for such groups. Excellent, excellent suggestion. Other thoughts? Other things that are working where you're at or that if you're not aware of that, what do you think can work? Yeah. Um, I'm from Rice University in Houston, Texas, and, and uh, one of the things that one of my staff members brought to me is how do we how are we perceived on the outside? Um, so when we're recruiting people, um, how is our organization viewed? Specifically, my Rice University, my security team, that sort of thing. And I'm a cybersecurity, I'm a CISO, um, and similar to probably your experience, a lot of my team are second career cyber people, which is amazing, which is really great. Um, but one of the things that I've challenged our groups to do is participate in groups like women in cybersecurity um, to make sure that they are showing up as allies and that they have an opportunity to meet people and really get our brand out, what Bryce is trying to do, what my team is trying to do. So the actionable thing I think you could take away from is participate in groups and let people know that you're the kind of organization that is inclusive. And it's more than a statement from my university, right? It's, it's, we see it in our action, who we hire and what we show the world. So. Uh, uh, brilliant. Uh, that is uh, a good point regarding uh, the brand of your organization and what people may perceive it or what you think about it. So thank you for sharing that. Do you want to add? I'm just going to say um, Women in Cybersecurity is an organization that we work closely with. Uh, sharing the student program, you know, we make sure that we promote it through those channels. And I think we actually have a number of our students were with that organization. I don't know if they're here today. It might be a little early for them. Uh, but if you're from the WESIS organization, oh, we got yet yeah, one. Wonderful. But yes, thank you very much. Good suggestion. All right. So I, I wanted to share another thought, um, which I had before I, I built off of Abe's earlier comment. Um, uh, so you mentioned what are people doing? What actions are they taking? Um, so I wanted to talk about at least one experience I've had. Um, Sean and I are both heavily involved in organizing a number of the top tier cybersecurity conferences, uh, including IEEE Security and Privacy and the annual Computer Security uh, Applications Conference. Uh, and similar to, to Jim's observation about what this group looked like, you know, demographically, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, we looked at a lot of those conferences and saw that there wasn't a lot of women represented uh, in the attendees and the program committees and what have you. And so one of the things that I and a number of members in the community did was uh, coming back to Cheryl, mm -hmm. Cheryl's comments about intentionality is we started working proactively to see how we could bring more um, minorities and more women and others in, into the fold. And so I actually started maintaining a, a list of women in cybersecurity. And I would give that list to program committee members who would otherwise tell me, well, I don't know who's out there. I don't know who to invite. Uh, and so uh, over years, this list grew from less than 100 to you know the point where I had the names of 400 women uh, and was making this available to people. They were bringing those people into their uh, program committees. And I think if you look now, you know, 10 years later, uh, you'll see uh, it may not be, you know, perfect parity, right? I mean, it should be closer to 50-50, uh, but the pe percentages have definitely increased. And I think it's just a good example of uh, what folks were saying in terms of you have to be intentional uh, about it and you also have to be patient because it takes time. It's not the kind of thing uh, you just snap your fingers and it happens mm -hmm. overnight. Uh, but I wanted to just uh, sort of highlight that as an example of something that we've tried to do in some of the, uh, the large uh, cybersecurity venues. 
I've used David's list. It's liquid gold. Uh, no, it's, it's really fantastic to have this because you're saying, I want to hire more people. Um, wh where do I find them? It's on David's list. Um, that being said, this is women in cybersecurity. Um, we need more, more of these lists. Uh, where do we have uh, black computer scientists? Uh, where do we have Native American computer scientists? Um, uh, I, I need those because, again, we have a talent shortage. Um, uh, a perceived talent shortage, but there are other second career kinds of people that we can be adding to these lists to, to grow our talent pool and support our organizations. And so I'm, I'm appreciative of, of this direct step as well. And, and you make a point about uh, expanding that list. When we talk about affirmative action, affirmative action leaving, um, our, the irony of it, affirmative action benefited you know, white women particularly or women uh, in general. Um, more so than uh, people of color, et cetera. And so when you talk to or you look out at uh, companies or et cetera, and you th talk about affirmative action, or you talk about diversity, you know, the conversation usually stops around gender. Um, but when it, you know, we're, our numbers are great. Our percentages are great. We have a, close to 50-50 parity. And then you ask them, well, how about your, you know, your Latinx or your African-American population? Oh, well, we're not. We're not doing so well in that. And, and that happens because there's not that intentionality that, that exists. So, so even though uh, from the legal sense of affirmative action for um, higher institutions, et cetera, the next phase of that will be you know, employers and employment. And they will start looking at how to get rid of programs that are designed to bring in uh, people that fit that umbrella. So this room has a lot of power in that. And this conversation is about what can be done on your level in order to uh, make a difference or, or continue that. So that did, were you looking at me? Did you have something that you wanted to say or you were just, uh, okay, you're listening to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are there any more uh, comments about this before um, I ask our panelists to close us out? Um, we have a couple more now. Oh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> uh, my name is Julio Cardenas from UC Davis. I just want to share something that in my life, right, since being a student, I had the opportunity to be in the program for minorities. And that helped me so much. It's, it's something that I see that the program is since about 40 years ago, mm -hmm. right? It's there, it's been growing. Slowly, but in some way effective because I am a product of, 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 from that. Um, and I really be thankful for being uh, here at the UC family because it just provided me the opportunity to continue, right? And to achieve some goals that I have. So it's not easy for somebody from a minority to, to achieve some goals, um, graduate from a university. Uh, but again, the problem is, is here. People need to know, right? Uh, in my case, I just feel obliged now to help, just to spread the word and, and bring these new people to this program. There are a lot of people that <clears throat> they are capable to do things and bring this family bigger and stronger. Sometimes when I see the, the news and talk about how bad can be minorities and bad people coming in, it's true. But I'm pretty sure the majority are good people. So this applies to my children too. Because the opportunity is here. We just need to let them know that they are here. So 
Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. There are a couple. Uh, he works for me. Yeah. <laughs> <Nice>. Proud. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mohammed Smail from Tennessee Tech University. Uh, can you hear me? A little bit louder. Okay. Yeah. I, I was saying I'm Mohammed Smail from Tennessee Tech University. Uh, first, because Wieses was brought up like, a couple of times, I'd like to say that the, the founder of Wieses, Dr. Ambarin Saraj, she's a former professor at Tennessee Tech. Uh, she left Tennessee Tech two years ago to be a, a program manager in the NSF. Uh, yeah. Anyway, since we are talking about actions that we are trying to do to improve diversity and, and inclusion, uh, our numbers at Tennessee Tech show that like 14% of our students are identified as females, while across camp in the Department of Computer Science while across campus it's almost 50-50, okay? So one thing that we try to do is to establish a bridge program where we allow uh, female students that have a bachelor degree in any uh, major to take specific courses and then they would be eligible to do master in computer science or master specifically in cybersecurity, okay? Uh, this we hope that eventually it will balance the numbers as we draw more students across campus to major and specialize in cybersecurity. Uh, we applied for the grant last year. We were not successful. We tried this year again, and we'll keep trying until we, we achieve this goal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I think we have like one more, and then that will, our time will be up. Hi, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, my name is Danielle, and I wanted to offer kind of a slightly different uh, perspective to this conversation. I am a student. Um, I have not worked in this field very long. Um, I, from what I've heard from this room, it's all great. But from the level that a lot of people here are standing at, you can talk about inclusion and wanting to make your company more inclusive and more diverse. But you can only do so much at the level you're at if you're not looking at the people who are working for you and ensuring that they have those same ideals. Um, I have been in a few different positions in my life where they have talked about wanting to be diverse, but when you look at the room and you're talking to the people that you're actually working with, they do not follow those ideals. And that is where a lot of that problem fosters is your company may look like it will be trustworthy and such, but if your students or your employees are not, uh, there's only so much you can do. And those employees on the middle or lower levels of a company are the ones who are going to be telling other people whether you should work there or not. So if I could offer any advice, it's talk to your employees, see where, where there are fewer people in your company or where there are more um, complaints per se, look at those people and see what you can do to make those people who are causing those problems uh, more aware of how much these people are needed in your area. That is an excellent point. And we also have to make sure we hold those middle managers particularly accountable um, for um, what they they share with their um, other employees that they manage. So thank you for saying that. Thank that was you. a very um, important way to end on that. I'm going to turn, I have two minutes left and I'd like to turn to our panelists to answer this final question, probably 30 seconds each. Um, what do you think the members of this audience can do starting today to help uh, achieve the diversity initiatives that we've talked about? I very much appreciate your comment because you're spot on. And, and let me just in 25 seconds say this to you personally. You're absolutely right. When I begin a recruitment, I'm not the person recruiting. Clearly, I've got managers who recruit, but they know what I'd like. And so I'm intentional about our recruitments. I will pause a recruitment. I will suspend a recruitment if we don't bring in a very diverse pool. And so your, your comments are spot on, and I think it goes to leadership. As we said before, we're intentional. You met one of my staff members who just spoke. We're intentional. And to your point, we do spread the message that this is the type of individual we want to come and work for us at UC Davis the kind of individual who appreciates diversity, the kind of individual who appreciates teamwork, the kind of individual who can build that relationship so that we can get the job done. So you are spot on. Thank you for sharing that comment. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'll offer two things. First one I said earlier, if you want people from under underrepresented groups, go where they are overrepresented. So let's say on your campus, if you involve students in your work at all, make sure that when you're recruiting students to work in your office, you're going to the your, your chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers, your chapter of the Society of Women Engineers. Like you're you're actually making sure that these people know about your positions that you know you can advertise. The second thing I'll say is arm yourself with data. Um, it, it can really make a difference. It seems to me that in a lot of work in science and tech, we are fairly rigorous about the work. And then somehow when we get to these issues around DEI, we just hand wave. And people talk about the pipeline and oh, I wish we could get more kindergartners interested in science and tech. And, you know, well, that's a very long timeline, but guess what? Have you ever looked at the pipeline? Like, do you actually know what the percentages are in the pipeline that you're recruiting from? Does this organization match that pipeline? And I've been shocked, sadly, at Berkeley Lab at, you know, the extent to which, at least, you know, for one population that I care a lot about, which is black scientists, we're not even matching what's in the pipeline. So we can't blame the pipeline. So arm yourself with data. Uh, for me, I think uh, it, I'm not going to give advice to anyone, but one thing that I try to do is be, um, we were talking about this before this panel, empathetic. I mean, opening yourself up to other people, trying to understand where they're coming from, especially if they have different opinions than you or they come from a different background. Uh, learning to understand what motivates them, why they have certain views, it can help you educate yourself more about things you don't know or perhaps even you know, influence them or have them uh, see your point of view. Uh, you know, I think with the way that we now are so uh, in these little uh, social media circles and bubbles and we're very insular. And I think that we, we really have lost the sense of, of community. And so for me, I just try to make sure that I can, I can really understand the people I work with, where they come from and be respectful for them. And I think that can really, at least for me personally, it's allowed me to really grow and, and I think be a lot more uh, productive at work and uh, more innovative when it comes to the work I do with the people I work with. Yeah, um, so I can talk uh, about my experience and I think um, I, I wanna, you know, um, put this in the brain of every, everyone here because I think uh, um, one of the, we talk a lot about doing mentorship of others, right? But some people like women, we have men been mentored, you know, to death, right? So um, something that it helped me a lot during my career and actually made a huge difference was uh, sponsorship mm -hmm. besides all the mentorship. Uh, so really putting your career in line for, for other people uh, really helps minorities. So um, I, I think that's uh, a very important point that we, we need to st start thinking more about. Um, the, the notion of uh, sponsorship and also um, uh, to be a bystander. If you see things that are not fair around you, speak up and advocate because sometimes the people that are suffering those uh, and injustices in their professional life, they cannot advocate uh, for, for themselves. Um, so I will uh, close with those two notes. And, and with that, uh, we're all allies here. Um, you're here getting some information that um, the people that are not in this room do not have. So um, what we're looking at, I do look out in this room and I see some students in the audience. And uh, one of the best ways of being allyship, as this young lady mentioned, was, you know, you're having leadership and, and bringing in students is great. And that pipeline that Damien's talking about is awesome. But how about looking at lateral executive level and also leaders that are actually the ones that are creating the policies and the procedures to bringing in uh, talent? Talent doesn't always have to begin entry level for women and people of color. It can start from the top as well. So with that, thank you all for your attention and your time. Uh, and we uh, had a pleasure uh, with this panel and look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.